Welcome everybody. It is my absolute pleasure to have you all here today and joining us for our annual Australian Banking Association and the Trans-Tasman Business Circle Economic Forecast for 2023. My name is Tanya Oziel and I'm the Chief Executive of the Trans-Tasman Business Circle. I would like to acknowledge the original custodians of Australia and pay our respects to the elders past and present. We acknowledge and celebrate all First Peoples of this land and their enduring connection to country, centuries of resilience and ongoing contributions. And a special warm welcome to all First Nations people with us today. For those of you who do not know The Circle, uh, we are a platform for the delivery of strategic thinking and thought leadership. We pride ourselves on being the, uh, a growth partner, sorry, <laughs> is this working? Yes. A growth partner for the region's leading organisations in the public and private sector. It is now our 30th year and I want to pay tribute to, where are you Johnny, which table are you on? There you are, our Founder and Managing Director, Johnny Weiss. We've worked together for 30 years. And I started with him when I was five years old and we are having, <laughs> we've done a lot of lunch in 30 years. Um, it's also our 40, the 40th year of, uh, of CER and we are thrilled to see where we evolve next. And we love to create ideas, bring people together and just really be a, a provider of great content and, uh, and great opportunities. Um, I also would like to pay tribute to our cousins in New Zealand. It's a terrible time for New Zealand at the moment and um, really would like to acknowledge what uh, the country's going through. So today, our wonderful guest speakers. Our discussion today will showcase the way in which the nation's banks and governments have played a pivotal role in maintaining Australia's path for pan from pandemic to prosperity. And on that note, I'm pleased to welcome our guest speakers today, Peter King, the Honourable Anna Bly, and the Honourable Jim Chalmers, who will be uh, joining us by pre-recorded video. He was very much wanting to be here today, but couldn't leave Canberra. So thank you to uh, our speakers for your on ongoing trust to provide you with a platform and uh, of course the partnerships and how much we have um, enjoyed working with you, especially to the, to the ABA. We've got a wonderful uh, partnership that's gone now four years we've been doing this lunch and uh, long may it continue. So, to our partners, thank you to, um, of course, the Australian Banking Association, to our sponsors, IBM, Snowflake, Workday, Appian and ServiceNow for supporting this event. We could not do our work without you, so thank you again. And uh, you and your teams work tirelessly with us to make sure that we, we deliver outcomes. A reminder that we are on the record today and you can follow the discussion on the Twitter handle at Business Circle or via our hashtag, The Network Effect. If you'd like to know more about The Circle, come see any of us. We love conversations, we love creating things. We are Australia, New Zealand, Singapore. Uh, we have a global outreach program through our study tours um, to Israel and Silicon Valley. And we have a wonderful and dedicated new brand, Women Leaders by The Circle, which really focuses on female leadership. Um, we have a, a very exciting 2023 Women Leaders Study Tour, Reimagining Our Future, Reconciliation, Sustainability and Inclusion that will be led by Anne Sherry. We'll be going to Uluru, we'll be going to Sydney and we'll be going to Canberra. So. Without further ado, I am now uh, very happy to very happy to pass over to David Hook from IBM, who will formally welcome you all today. And thank you again for being with us. Good afternoon, and thank you, Tanya, for uh, the warm introduction. Um, as Tanya mentioned, my name's David Hook and I'm, um, I'm IBM's Managing Director for Westpac Group and it gives me great pleasure to represent IBM today at such an important event. Last weekend I, I said to my 16-year-old son Jordan uh, that I was attending today's event and I thought I'd test my luck and ask him his thoughts on the economic outlook. Um, he's been studying business and economics at school and I thought well, it would be interesting to see his perspective. Predictably, his comment was, I don't really care, and surely, Mum and Dad, you've got it under control. Um, I, I love his confidence, but I'm not so sure. Um, for a moment, I thought, maybe I'll, uh, I'll just let it go, but I decided, no, I will persevere, uh, and I'll try and engage on the topic. And, and so we talked about the events over the last couple of years, or uh, particularly with the, um, the pandemic and now the, the rising um, escalation in, in Ukraine. 
And the flow on effects from the, the unprecedented stimulus, uh, fiscal stimulus, the skilled shortages with borders being closed, supply chain issues um, that have caused inflation, resulting in central banks raising interest rates, and I guess it's ultimately led to the um, cost of living crisis that we'll probably hear a lot more about today. While he still didn't seem to have a view on the outlook, uh, the next thing did surprise me, which was he's been studying at, uh, at school around the Great Depression, and he said, seems to be a number of similarities. Um, and he said, technology seemed to be a big contributor to the recovery of, uh, of the time, and surely technology is going to play a part again this time. So we talked about the decisions the US government made at the time to try and boost economic activity, including the introduction of social security legislation to protect citizens, you know, in a future downturns. And the pressure this put on businesses to comply with employee data, the need to record, store and manage. These demands accelerated and I guess was the early forms of automation. What he didn't know was that IBM was one of those companies that spearheaded the recovery. Uh, while IBM was just one company among many that helped to support, our investments in technology and research and development helped to create jobs, improve efficiency and drive innovation, all of which were important factors in the recovery of the US economy. While it's been nearly a century since the start of the Great Depression, IBM once again has a strong position that technology is going to play a critical role in helping both public and private sectors not only combat the current economic challenges, but also help drive other social pressures like sustainability, skills shortages and cyber resiliency. IBM's current strategy is firmly hinged on helping organisations maximise the value of their data. Data is arguably one of the most valuable assets an organisation possesses and unlocking the insights from this data will allow for reduction in operational costs, a reprioritisation of skills, a reduction in cyber crime, improved customer experiences and ultimately a greater return on st for stakeholders. We believe that technology will, across many industries, fast track growth through advances that can improve efficiency and increase productivity using in, uh, automation and AI. Technology can also create new jobs, emerging industries such as clean energy, e-commerce, the healthcare technology. These industries offer opportunities for workers that may have been displaced during the pandemic. The pandemic has accelerated the adoption of remote work um, and many companies are likely to continue to offering remote work. This, this can increase workforce participation and hopefully reduce commuting costs. The pandemic had also led to a surge in e-commerce. More, more people have turned to online shopping and this trend is likely to continue. Uh, and this will ultimately increase e-commerce infrastructure investment. And advances in healthcare technology such as telemedicine and remote patient monitoring are all going to increase access to healthcare and reduce healthcare costs. All will help create new jobs and boost, boost economic growth. While these are just a few examples, all heavily rely on the ability for organisations to manage and consume data in ways that users can make informed decisions. Having a robust data strategy is, a key, is key to better decision making, improved efficiencies, increased innovation, better, better risk management and data compliance. The economic forecast for 2023 is obviously an anticipated event and, uh, you know, Today's discussion around the future of, uh, of our economy is, is obviously well received with the turnout we have today. So we have some very credible speakers this, this, this afternoon, far more so than myself or my 16-year-old son's perspective, but um, welcome to today. Uh, thank you for joining us. Enjoy lunch and the formalities will start shortly. Thank you. All right, this is the time now I need you to pay a little bit of attention. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Julia Gilmore. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the regional sales director of Workday here in Australia looking after our large enterprise business. I was um, quite nervous about being here today, and then I realized that what I have to do is a lot 
less intimidating than announcing to the world that we had destroyed science projects and that they weren't actually Chinese spy balloons that we'd shot down science projects. So uh, mine is a little bit easier to do than, than what they had to do. Wouldn't you agree that was an absolutely delicious meal? Adding that to meeting new people in a great venue, the perfect combination. Thank you very much to the organizers. I'm tasked with a couple of things today. The first one is to introduce the Honorable Jim Chalmers, MP, Treasurer of Australia. He was looking forward to joining us in person, but as you've heard, unfortunately, he's not available. He's working remotely in Logan. He has kindly prepared some remarks, which we'll be sharing with you later on a bit. And secondly, to talk a bit about Workday. So being a little bit, natural, not a little bit, being a bit cheeky, I thought what I'd do in taking that a third of the ABA full members make use of Workday as customers, as well as 50% of the Fortune 500, you may have known us. You do know about us, possibly. But in case you don't, put simply, Workday is an intelligent digital backbone empowering enterprises to adapt and manage their people and money. It makes perfect sense, people and money in the same place. So it's a future-ready system that you would never have to upgrade again. I was really surprised that our studies show that only 30% of the banks globally have moved their financial systems to the cloud. And of that 30%, 70% have chosen Workday Financials because it was built for the cloud. I didn't just want to stand up here and recite brochureware. So I thought I'd lean on our customers and see what they have to say, particularly around benefits in areas that are touching the industry today. So the CFO of Latitude said, Workday helps support the finance function by providing analytics and reports so we can see around corners. I wish I had that skill. The VP of Global Finance of Aon said, we have financial results the minute a transaction is posted. No waiting. This makes a significant impact on our ability to close the books and gives us the insight and confidence we need to make sound decisions. And finally, CFO Challenger Bank Sydney. We recently acquired a bank and with Workday were able to integrate their systems and migrate off the old legacy GL within only 10 weeks compared to two years for a, pre a similar size acquisition previously. The speed and effectiveness of Workday materially de-risked our integration and created capacity, improving engagement of our team. So it's not just those customers. We have some customers here in the room, and Snowflake have been partners of ours since 2018. They make use of our software to automate fa financials, human resources, planning, and budgeting and in so doing, accelerating the ability to forecast revenue, anticipate costs, understand each customer, and with a lot less effort. So, back to my main task. It is an honor to have the treasurer join us today, even if it is in a remote capacity. He has a reputation as a tireless and passionate advocate for his constituents, and we are eager to hear his thoughts on the current economic landscape and how we can all work together as Australians to support growth and prosperity for all Australians. I have no doubt that his insights and experience will provide a valuable perspective for us all, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to hear from him today. So without further ado, my tasks are done. Let's turn our attention to the Treasurer. Thank you very much. Sydney and Kia ora to our great friends from New Zealand. I wanted to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation where you're gathering today and their elders, culture and customs. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't make it to see you in person on this occasion this year, but I appreciate the opportunity you've given me to send this quick message from Ngunnawal and Ngambri country in Canberra. And I wanted to do this for two reasons. First, because I see this as another chance to strengthen the respectful and productive relationship that I've been fortunate to have with the business community as treasurer and as shadow treasurer before that. And second, because our government recognises how important an even stronger trans-Tasman relationship is for both of our countries, for our governments, our business networks and our communities more broadly. I think that was underscored by Prime Minister Hipkins' visit to Australia last week, continuing that special friendship that we developed with Prime Minister Ardern and her predecessors as well. 
And for many years, I've been so lucky to call Grant Robertson, not just my counterpart, but my friend as well. And I look forward to continuing to work with him in his important portfolio. Now, 2023 is a big year for the Trans-Tasman Partnership, as you know. We are celebrating 40 years of closer economic relations, acknowledged as one of the most comprehensive and effective trade arrangements in the world. And our countries are obviously alike in a lot of ways, and it's the case that we're grappling with fairly similar economic challenges at the moment. So forums like this make a lot of sense, and I commend you for convening us. I know you've gathered to consider the outlook for the year ahead, and obviously that's something we've been doing a fair bit of in the last few months as well with my Cabinet colleagues in the lead up to our second budget in May. And there's no use getting around the reality of a challenging year for the global economy, and we'll feel the impact of that in our part of the world. Uh, like New Zealand and like a lot of other countries, the defining feature of the Australian economy in 2023 is inflation. And that's why it's our government's major focus. We've got a three-point plan for addressing the inflation challenge, uh, relief, repair and restraint. We're providing responsible cost of living relief where it delivers an economic dividend and doesn't add excess demand. We've started the work to repair damaged supply chains, which have only exacerbated this inflation challenge, including widespread skills and labour shortages. And we're showing spending restraint in the budget so that the government isn't adding further to the inflation in the economy. Now, we know that migration is one part, but not the only part, of addressing the labour shortages that we're experiencing on both sides of the ditch. Uh, that's why we've delivered a responsible increase to the migration cap at the same time as we're funding more vocational training places as well. Uh, as I think you'd be aware, my colleague Claire O'Neill is also leading a comprehensive review of our migration system, including looking at how it can better meet our future workforce needs. But migration is about much more than building the right labour force. It's crucial for that. It's also about people building a life as well. And I know at a local level, the area that I grew up in, live in and represent around Logan City in the southern suburbs of Brisbane, has among the largest numbers of New Zealand-born residents of any part of Australia, including a big and proud Maori contingent who I joined for Waitangi Day this month. Now, I couldn't imagine our community without them. It wouldn't be as diverse or as welcoming or as strong. And they aren't just New Zealanders to us. They are a central part of our community and our country, and we consider them Aussies. Uh, but the law doesn't. And this has been a big issue for a long time, and I wanted to acknowledge it in this forum, the difficulty that so many New Zealanders have getting on a pathway to citizenship in Australia. Uh, Prime Minister Albanese was working closely with Prime Minister Ardern through some of the different citizenship issues uh, for New Zealanders living in Australia, and he's now continuing that really important work with Prime Minister Hipkins as well. The intention is for these issues to be resolved and for a new way forward to be settled by Anzac Day, so in a few months' time. Now, these issues aren't simple, but the general principle is simple. New Zealanders who've settled in Australia, who are building their life in Australia, who are contributing to a better future for Australia, shouldn't have to be considered as temporary residents in Australia forever. There's a lot of good work and goodwill from both sides, and I'm confident, I'm confident that we'll have some good news on that pretty soon. And even in a tricky and trying year, because of all the good work and all the goodwill across a heap of areas, I'm really optimistic about the future of our economies and the future of this Trans-Tasman partnership. I know that we can align our values and strengthen our economies and our communities at the same time. And I know that if we keep working together and learning together, we'll keep growing together. Another 40 years of partnership, even more productive and even more prosperous than the last. Thanks very much. Uh, g'day, everyone. Uh, my name's Chris Rath, and I work for Snowflake. Um, I want to thank uh, Jim Chalmers for his, uh, for his session, albeit we're disappointed not to see him here in person. 
Um, before we get into the main course and I introduce the panelists, just very briefly, uh, we just had a really great session uh, and we talked a lot about the headwinds in the economy and, and you'd, you'd be, you know, fair enough to be a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit down or a little bit worried about what's coming. Um, there's, we recently had our CEO out here and he had about 12 or 14 meetings with leaders and one of the constant uh, to, one of the constant phrases he, he gave everybody and that, that was his mantra was actually from a Formula One driver by the name of Ayrton Senna and I think it's really pertinent for the current situation we're in. And I hope I don't butcher this, but essentially Ayrton Senna says, you can't pass 15 drivers on a sunny day, but you sure can on a rainy one. So as we've got a lot of leaders in the room, I just thought that was a really nice motto and maybe something that you, you, know, you guys can take back to your team or just be part of your ethos. Um, let's get to the, to the main course, shall we? So I have the absolute pleasure to introduce our two panellists today. Uh, the first uh, panellist is the Honourable Anna Bly. Anna doesn't need much of an introduction. She's very well known. She was actually the Premier, uh, Premier of Queensland and the first female Premier. Uh, since 2017, she has led the ABA and she's led it through a really interesting time. She's delivered on the reforms or the rec and, and recommendations from the Royal Commission. She's also driven a whole lot of response in the financial industry to COVID. And I think if we look back at what she's done, it's fair to say that she's rebuilt trust and strengthened the culture in the financial services community in general. Um, so welcome, Anna, and we look forward to hearing your thoughts. And secondary, um, Peter King. Peter also doesn't need uh, much of an introduction. Uh, Peter's been with Westpac for almost 19 years in various roles. Um, prior to being this, you know, having the top job, the, C the CEO, he was the CFO, and he's also the uh, chair of the ABA. Um, I've also got a very good recommendation. He's a lovely, lovely b bloke. And that actually came from my mother, who was 20 years at Westpac. And uh, that's pretty high praise from her. So, <laughs> so without further ado, welcome, guys. Thanks. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, the format we're going to use this afternoon is actually I'm going to be interviewing Peter. Uh, so you're not going to get a lot of my thoughts, but I'm sure you're going to get a lot of his. So theoretically, I'm the boss at the moment, but that's <laughs> not going to be the case today. <laughs> um, theoretically. Okay, so uh, Peter, this, as you know, is a lunch we do um, every year. It's, we're wanting to make it a permanent part of the calendar. Uh, and an opportunity for um, the chair of the ABA at the time to kind of kick off the year with some um, observations, reflections on the broader economic outlook. So let's start with the economy. Um, you know, when you're looking, when you're sitting with your team and your board, how are you seeing this and how are you framing it? Yeah, so I think, um, uh, welcome everyone and thanks for, for coming today. I think uh, the word that, that I feel is uh, happening is transition. So if we think about last year, uh, we think about an environment where we came out of COVID, we came out of COVID strong, whether it was, uh, whether it was demand, whether it was employment, whether it was people saving, we, we, we really did as a country bounce back. Uh, but unfortunately, um, we couldn't foresee some of the supply chain issues, some of the, obviously the war uh, and the implications that that's created for a lot of of what's happened. So we are transitioning now, unfortunately, through a blunt tool called uh, interest rates, uh, and it is a blunt tool. Uh, and so this year, I think, is one where it will get uh, a little bit tough. Uh, not for everyone. It's, uh, the thing about interest rates is it's, it's fairly blunt, so it doesn't impact everyone equally. And, and so I think we're going to have some people that don't have a large impact, some people that need to tighten their belt to get through and some that we really need to, uh, to help uh, to get through. So when we, you know, when we at Westpac are sitting around the table this year, we still see opportunities to grow. We still see uh, parts of the economy that will do well. Uh, uh, we're ready for that. We're ready to, to grow and support. But we also know that it's this transition year for a lot of people will get a lot harder uh, and we need to be there to help them through that period as well. Clearly, along with transition, um, inflation is going to be one of the 
catchwords for 2023. So the million dollar question, um, uh, inflation was higher in December. Uh, how long do you think it's going to take to bring it down? Yeah, hard question. But I think it's, it, it feels like it's on the way down is the good news. Um, and uh, I think each quarter from here, we will start to see uh, it come down. Um, the flip side of that question, of course, is where do interest rates go? Um, I might be jumping ahead in your questions. I'm not no, sure. you go for it. <laughs> uh, you know, we, I, I'd always felt a three and a half to four percent range is what we were probably uh, needing to, uh, to to slow it down. I was hoping for closer to three and a half than than four, but it's feeling like we'll be closer to four than three and a half at the moment. And uh, you know, from our perspective, I think from um, from a consumer perspective, a lot of um, a lot of those, if we get up to that. Uh, four percent range. It's beyond the expectations of a lot of people when they took out loans. So uh, they will need to either get a pay rise or uh, reduce spending, and so that will feed through the the economy as well. But you know, I, th I think it's it's coming down. Um, hopefully, it comes down fast. Uh, but if it doesn't, we'll probably have a prolonged period of of high interest rates to really get it back down to where it needs to be. And I think we should just. I think th th we talk about inflation, but really what it is is, um, you know, it, people have less, they really just divert less, more of their income, sorry, to to living, whether it's power, whether it's insurance, whether it's, you know, the, the house and the roof over their head, um, and they don't have a lot left over to do some of the other things. So we, when, you, when you talk about in those words, it really is something that we need to get down because the quality of living for a lot of people will reduce if we have prolonged high inflation. Mm. So Peter, if we were to see interest rates get up into that close to four, you know, maybe another two to 3.85, another three, uh, you know, that as you said is beyond the, the expectations of a lot of borrowers. Um, as you're going into the new year, um, what are you starting to see in your customer behaviour? Or what are you seeing in your book in terms of customer stress on payments, whether it's mortgages or yeah. credit cards or personal loans, what are you seeing? So right now, uh, we just uh, gave an update on the December uh, quarter for, for the bank and uh, things improved. And th these are big averages, so not everyone will feel that way from an individual perspective, but stress in our loan portfolio actually reduced. Mortgage, 90-day uh, mortgage delinquencies actually reduced. There's some increase in some of the shorter uh, delinquencies, but that tends to happen over Christmas when people go on holidays and don't pay. So it's not a uh, not a concerning uh, piece. But I, I certainly think you know that that says we're as best as we can be going into what will be a tougher environment. So that's the you know that's where we start, and so that gives me some confidence that we we start from a perspective of of strength for most people. Uh, but we do acknowledge that not everyone will feel the same way, and uh, certainly will be to be ready to help those who need a bit of help. So, Peter, one of the things we hear a lot about um, in the public debate on this issue and in the media is this idea that particularly people, well, the people who have been on a fixed rate, interest rate, um, particularly those who took advantage of much lower interest rates during COVID, uh, many of them will be coming off those fixed term arrangements. And we hear this talk of a mortgage cliff. Um, I've already said in the public arena, I th don't think the language is very helpful, but um, I just wonder how you're thinking about and how your bankers, people in your bank are thinking about um, customers as they come off that fixed rate and how you're going to help manage that with them. Yeah, well, there's no, I should just say there's no cliff and, and I'll unpack that. So uh, if you're a mortgage holder, whether you're variable or fixed, your rate is going up. It's just the speed of the change. So. Everyone needs to get, um, you know, be thinking about where they're going to uh, go to. Variable rate um, uh, mortgage holders are just feeling it early. Fixed rate um, mortgage holders will feel it later. Uh, but we assume that the fixed rates would revert back to variable and added a buffer. So um, uh, I don't see the nature of the loan as creating the problem. What normally happens uh, with a loan is people's circumstances change. Sickness, health, divorce are the top three things that normally drive um, uh, uh, people to not be able to pay their loan. Unemployment's the biggest one. So the, the thing we're watching so closely at the moment is unemployment because that will impact demand uh, in the economy. Uh, 
But we always see that people prioritise uh, their house, so we would expect the vast, vast majority of people to prioritise repaying their house, uh, keeping the, the roof over their, their head, if you like. That is, is what happens when it gets tough, but it does mean they stop spending on other areas uh, in the economy, uh, and, and often that is small business that will uh, feel that impact. So you know, certainly from, from our perspective, we're watching unemployment very closely, but we're also watching our, uh, our business book, particularly our small books, small, in, small business books in, in more discretionary areas and, and seeing how they're going. But there's no cliff. <laughs> so if somebody, you know, are you, have you got people actually working through and looking, you know in advance when someone's fixed rate is finishing? Yeah. And proactively contacting, how do you manage with those? Yeah, customers? well, I think as, it's not just, so all borrowers, we're encouraging to think about this, whether it's variable or fixed. Um, you know, certainly if it's fixed, we will contact them six months out to get them thinking about it, but frankly, given how much our press has been at it, I don't think there's too many people that aren't thinking about it. Mm -hmm. uh, we need, um, you know, but we need people to, to, to take action now. And, and the other thing from all the bank's perspectives actually is if people need help, the best thing they can do is call us early. That is, that is the best thing. Time, there's lots of options for us in the way that we uh, can help people through these times. And we might recall the GFC, and we might, might recall that the banks, uh, uh, under the guidance of APRA, increased capital, increased liquidity. The reason we did that was so, so that when times get tough, we can both uh, support, uh, customers need support, but also continue to lend and grow uh, the economy. So a lot of the heavy work that we did in the last decade for capital and liquidity will hold us in good stead for, for the period ahead. Mm -hmm. I might just go to a slightly different um, area. I think it's fair to say that probably it's going to take a decade for us to be able to look back with the benefit of hindsight and identify with accuracy how did COVID change the world. But we already have um, lots of evidence about changes that um, appear to be sustained post COVID. And one of those is the rapid acceleration of customers moving into digital banking channels. People who weren't there already have jumped in as because they were in lockdown and because there was you know restrictions on when they could go and where, and there were branches that were you know temporarily closed because you had staff who were sick and all of those things accelerated a trend that was already happening. As those customers are, as you increase the customers in that digital world, um, those people who used to be bank robbers with sawn-off shotguns are now you know sitting. Um, in front of a laptop and on the end of a phone, trying to get into those accounts and into that money in a different way. And I'm just wondering, how, what are you seeing in scams? How is your bank thinking about it? Um, how do you see um, you know, all of the players in the system that, are, you know, that scammers work and play to get through and how we can work on that better? Uh, it's a, it's many angles on this. So I think if I, if I look at the typical scams that are quite big at the moment, investment scams, uh, and if you think of the, the, the process there, often there's advertising on a social platform to, to get people to uh, you know, get interested, then there's an application, then there's money moves, and then there's money lost. Um, and so you actually end up having social platforms, telcos, banks, and, and then hopefully some recovery if we can get it involved. So it needs a coordinated approach across uh, multi-sectors to get after this. Uh, we need less, you know, one of the challenges with ha not having uh, as many financial planners in the country is people do their own financial planning often online. So that's one of the issues. The country actually needs more financial planners so people can get quality advice. Uh, we also need to stop uh, these fake PDSs. You know, you, you, I've seen examples uh, for Westpac where you look at it and go, that's c clearly fake. It's too good a deal, it's too good an offer, but yet people are still clicking through and then still investing their money. And then the first quarter when they don't get their interest, they follow up and they realise it's gone. So this is, you know, this is life changing for individuals when they're losing a lot of their savings. Uh, so we've got to stop the the advertisement, we've got to get more financial planning. We need to work on uh, how we stop uh, telecommunications being used inappropriately. So at Westpac, we've put 
all our phone numbers on a do not call register with our telco provider, so it's hard to spoof our phone numbers. We don't have that solution for text, so we need a, a way that uh, texts can be um, authenticated. Uh, at the moment, people can spoof our number and put a what in a, in a thread of Westpac official um, text, slide a dodgy text into it and people think uh, it's real. So we need, need to sort out the text piece. Uh, and then uh, we need, I've jumped over education actually, we need to educate people about uh, don't click on texts, banks won't ask you to move money to another account to keep it safe. We just don't do that. We won't put links in texts where you need to put in uh, information. So consumer education is really important. Uh, and then we need to do a bit uh, ourselves as an industry to slow down the movement of funds to, to make sure that we can stop things a, a little bit quicker, which we're working on as well. So hopefully you get a sense it's, um, it's not, there's not one silver bullet for this. It's got to be cross industry. It's a big issue for those that get caught uh, and we're working on it as a priority with the government, uh, with the banks, with the, uh, with the telcos and with the regulators. Um, great. I should have actually said at the beginning that um, while I get the pleasure of interviewing Peter for a while, we will be throwing it open to um, questions from the audience. Uh, so um, uh, we do have a table of media here and I know they won't be shy with questions. Um, <laughs> but uh, it would be great to... Uh, so just as you're listening, we're going to traverse quite a few topics. If you've got questions on these or others, um, you know, we'd love to hear from you. Um, so sort of aligned with scams, we've seen um, at the end of last year a couple of very large corporates with big data breaches and I think the whole issue around um, data security, um, uh, privacy and keeping customers' um, information and, and particularly their identity documents and evidence as safe as possible, is, it's a huge area and I know it's one that you know, APRA is very keen on, um, making sure that banks are adequately supervised in that regard. But I think if we looked across the whole system, not just banks, um, but banks as part of corporate Australia and in partnership with government, where do you think there are areas for improvement um, that would actually help to protect people's identities? Well, if you, look at, uh, if you look at the design of the system at the moment, it's really a distributed design. So um, if I take our bank, you, you look at uh, when we have someone join the bank, we'll ask you for information. It could be your Medicare card, it could be your passport, it could be you know, other uh, information documents. And often uh, we need to keep that information uh, so that if something happens, we can give it back to another part of government. Uh, that's, we don't need it for ourselves, but we're giving it back to another part of government. So what, what you've got is a system where everyone is keeping versions or copies of the same information, that's a high risk system because it's very distributed. There, there is a solution. Um, rather than us asking for a copy of whatever the document is, all we really need to authenticate is it exists, it's real, and then we need a receipt that could be matched back to um, a central database. So for us, uh, certainly what we are advocating for is that the government have a central um, role in a system and rather than us distributing all these documents out, out to uh, everyone uh, in the country, you just keep a receipt. You know, you just keep a receipt of uh, Peter King is who he says based on this information, the bank keeps a receipt and if we later on have to give it to someone else, the receipt can be matched by the government to, to whoever it is. So that we see as a much safer system. It also allows things like uh, I could get notified if someone's accessing one of my documents as well. So there's, there's benefits for the consumer in, in the way that they can keep their safe because they, um, they get notifications of people accessing uh, their information. So there, it, it's there, parts of the system are starting to work that way. Um, but I think with uh, digital, uh, every company, the government is actually going digital. Uh, we, we, we just see COVID has accelerated the trend and so it is a big issue that we need to solve, not only for the banks, but I think for the country and, and there are solutions that we can get after. Still on the data theme, um, consumer data right. <laughs> uh, you know, there's been a lot of investment yep. uh, in this initiative. Um, how's it playing out in your bank? Where do you see it going next? Well, uh, I think we've got 14 million customers and we have 9,000 people using it. 
Uh, so I don't think that will be classified as uh, an efficient use of, of money at this point. Um, and certainly, uh, I, I think uh, we should be very cautious about opening up uh, or expanding open data to right access or, uh, or further expanding the capability. I think there's a number of um, options that we have in the economy that are more efficient than CDR. So let's, let's see what we've got. We should actually, uh, I think, be op uh, adding in some of the government data because if, uh, if you're a small business and you want to lend money, what do we ask for? Your tax return. So. Uh, there's a lot of efficiencies that I think we can get in the economy through adding other data sources in that can be used rather than looking to replicate some of the right capability that we have through the, the economy already. Hmm. Um, Peter, they say that um, a day is a long time in politics. It feels like a fortnight, the last fortnight has been a long, a very long couple of weeks in banking uh, where we've seen, uh, you know, the issues around interest rates really take off in the public um, consciousness, uh, as along with um, the federal parliament returning and the establishment of a raft of new parliamentary inquiries into various aspects of banking, so um, and heightened level of scrutiny. But on top of um, a growing list of expectations from government, whether it's open banking or regulators wanting more functionality on the new payments platform, uh, whether it's um, you know, the Reserve Bank wanting you know, various things to happen um, in various time frames. How do you think about you know, getting all of that done in the right way, in the way that's most effective and, most, and has the most impact on customer protection or customer um, convenience or the security of the system? So I think, I think the question is, how do you deal with the multitude of things that are coming at you at any one time? And it's, it is fair to say, um, you know, certainly as a large bank, uh, we've got the resources to handle it. But in you know, representing the ABA, there's a lot of small banks that uh, really struggle to, to meet it. We have you know, requirements from the Reserve Bank through real-time payments uh, from APRA. There's, there's no uh, shortage of things that we're doing for the, for the banking regulator. Uh, the ATO, um, uh, as well as the ACCC, and so there's just a lot. Uh, what we would really ideally like is a roadmap where we can actually um, put together the most important things, sequence it, commit to it, and deliver it. Uh, there's a, a bit of an analogy in Westpac of um, if, you're in a, if you're going to replace the road, let's rip it up once and, and do the multiple things, but to do that you need a roadmap. Um, and, and so whether it's, uh, whether it's payments, we think payments is really critical uh, for the economy in, in lots of ways, um, uh, and certainly a priority of the Reserve Bank. Uh, but we don't want to have uh, multiple changes to payments. We really want a four or five year roadmap where everyone goes, right, there's the goals, this is what we'll do. Uh, we should phase out checks. Uh, we should be phasing out direct entry or BECs. Uh, we should be moving more to the MPP. Uh, that's, you know, that's one of the options to solve some of the scams issues we were talking before because people can, can check names through, through the MPP. But the, the big issue for us is actually looking for a roadmap where we can, uh, as an industry, uh, work towards the same things, get everyone uh, there uh, and, and benefit the country. Okay, I could keep talking, and I'm sure Peter can, but I'm going to throw it over to the audience um, and invite questions from our guests uh, on, as I said, any of the topics that have been raised or any other topic in banking uh, that you've got an interest in. And we've got roving mics. Sure. Hi, my name's Masuda. I'm from Snowflake, and my question to you, Peter, is... What are your thoughts around ESG? What's your definition of ESG? <laughs> What's your roadmap or your strategy for ESG? Yeah. I'm interested to know. Oh, well, it, yeah. the E and the S and the G are all big in their own right. But um, probably the, the one that is uh, the, the foremost focus just at the moment is the E. Uh, and I think about, you know, we, we talk about it as climate, but really at the heart of it, it's about transforming particularly our electricity grid to be green. Um, and we're in, a, we're in a really critical period for the country where we've got um, some of the fossil fuel power coming out and the green power coming in. It's probably fair to say we haven't got exactly the timing right uh, on that yet. Um, uh, but uh, for the country, 
We need to find the land, we need to find the labour, we need to find the materials to really up the capability to produce uh, green electricity. Uh, and then once we've got uh, that green electricity, we can really start with the transformation of consumers and businesses. So climate's a big issue for us. Um, our investors are asking a lot, both uh, investors in the company, the, the people that own us and, and what we're doing, but I think increasingly international investors in Australia will be interested in what Australia is doing. So the, you know, the prior, this being a priority of, of the new government, I think is a good thing for, uh, for the country. On, on the yes, um, all businesses need to you know, have a purpose, you know, think about why they exist, um, uh, run their businesses in a way that contributes to society. So, you know, for banking, you, you get into areas like who will you bank, what will you support, how do you help vulnerable people, that's a big issue for us. And then you know, governance sort of wraps it all up because it's about the process of how you know uh, that you deliver what you do to customers and society is, is, is the G bit. So um, lots of, it's a big topic and hopefully that gets your sen gives you a sense of some of the top things we're thinking about. I should, actually, I should have said, and of course this year for the country, um, you know, Indigenous, uh, the vote we're going to have is, is critical for us and, uh, and that's something that we will be supporting as well. Um, we have another question down this end. Hi Peter, uh, Shane Flynn, IBM. Uh, interested in uh, where you're excited about financial liter literacy in children. Uh, we're seeing interesting innovation coming through from New Zealand in the Sharesies platform. Uh, Vanguard just came out recently with their offering as well. And as parents uh, who remember in the 80s, the Dolomites account where CBA were you know, the known household brand in that capacity um, with, with uh, technology innovation the way it is now and the speed. Just curious where, you know, where your thinking is in terms of involving children earlier about financial literacy, becoming aware of how to invest, how to use debt wisely, things like that. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm not sure you can go into schools anymore and, uh, and um, uh, promote banking products, so that's not really an, an option anymore. But, um, you know, certainly uh, we, we think engaging, engaging um, early for financial literacy is very good. So uh, some of the things that we do is uh, encourage people to open bank accounts. Um, uh, we've got the Davidson Institute, which is a way of, of training people. I think increasingly technology will be used to train or help people train themselves as well. So if you think about, you know, the bank really is becoming 24-7 uh, in your pocket and most people will, will be banking using uh, the phone set. That will be a key to helping people understand their money. So the way you present information, you, you, you know, the old bank statement's really going to go. You've got to categorise income, categorise expenses, help people budget. Um, and, and give them nudges. Uh, the way that we uh, help uh, gambling, people with a gambling uh, challenge. So we allow you to turn it off in the app uh, and um, you know, certainly that, that's another thing that we do, uh, not proactively, but certainly help people uh, avoid that, um, that challenge. So early's right, but I think digital will play an increasing part uh, and certainly the, the, the handset's one of the keys. Thank you. I think we've got one just down at this table here. Hi, um, my oh, name is lovely. Victoria Popovich. I'm with Macquarie. I work with um, our group Treasury, specifically in the liquidity market side. Uh, so I have a bit more of a prudential regulatory question, which you did touch on uh, in terms of APRA and all the changes that have, especially after the GSC, APRA introducing around liquidity and capital to really strengthen uh, the Australian banks. Um, I think a lot of us do agree that the banks are in a much better position than pre-GFC to face any financial crises, especially in a um, market downturn situation such as the GFC. Um, but with that said, especially compared to global peers. Um, I'm sure you're aware that APRA has taken a very, uh, well, a super equivalence approach or an unquestionably, um, unquestionably strong approach and um, in a lot of ways compared to uh, global regulators are quite conservative. Um, and of course, with that requirement to hold 
additional capital and additional liquidity, there is a cost, a real cost um, with that and also a cost from a compliance side. Um, so I know you've touched on that, you think it's a, a great thing that we're in a great position now, but I would like to get your thoughts a bit further around that cost versus potential benefit, considering especially we really haven't been in a situation where we've really needed to draw on those huge buffers that we're required to, to have. Yeah, well, I think the if you go back to the recommendation about why, it was the fact that Australia, or the, the banking system in Australia is a big importer of capital into the country through wholesale funding. So, uh, and, and, and the belief, the, you know, the proposition that was put forward was that we needed to be unquestionably strong. Um, you know, that, I think that debate sort of landed unfortunately, so, or fortunately, it's clear. Uh, and certainly to the international investors that we engage with don't have any issues about the strength of the Australian banking system. So you can always debate the sort of, you know, can it be a bit higher or a bit lower, but I think the purpose uh, is right. And we'll, you know, hopefully we don't get to use it this year. That's the, that's the best case outcome. But if we do need to use it, it's there. Uh, and I think it, it, it will be a good thing for the country because it means the banks can continue to land while also supporting. So. Uh, when I think about it through that particular lens, you know, a bit of optimisation maybe, but I think importantly it's more about you exist to help our society um, and it's a good thing. Thank you for that question. Um, I think we've actually got one on table 17, is that right? And then we'll Hi. come back over here. Hi, Pooja Lal from Accenture. Uh, just a quick one on what's your take on um, artificial intelligence and chat GPT? which I'm sure is on everyone's <laughs> mind at the moment. Well, the Westpac CTO is sitting on this table over here. I was talking to him about this morning. Um, I think it's a step change, actually. I think, uh, I think we've seen one of those, we've, we've just experienced one of those points where there's a new capability that's step changing uh, what we do. And some of, the, uh, some of the experiments that the teams are running with it are, are writing customer letters and, and the way that uh, they, the, the way it writes is unbelievable and it's probably better than what we can do and the, how fast it is. Um, you know, I was being educated about how software development will probably happen in the future. Um, you know, we need to work out the, the security and safety aspects to it because it's, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty much a shared platform at the moment. So um, we need to think about what we will do in it and what we won't and therefore what are the other capabilities. I think it's a step change. I think there's a lot of things that will change off the back of it. I think we've got, is it table, there we go, table 14. Uh, hi Peter, Ben Corey from Beringa Partners here. Yep. Um, so you touched briefly on residential mortgages and talked about historic drivers of uh, distress being unemployment, um, health and divorce. But kind of looking at the upcoming cycle, do you see serviceability having more of a role, particularly given that APRA only had a 2.5% buffer for a lot of the recent run-up and then only lifted it to 3% and you're talking about a 4% potential change in interest rates? Oh, certainly f for some borrowers it could, so that uh, if, we, you know, if we end up at the 4% the and people haven't got pay rises or they aren't able to um, reduce costs, then there may be issues, but there's also options for the bank to, to help customers through that period. So. So I don't, you know, I don't see it as, we don't see it as a, a, a big issue. We, we're monitoring closely the part of the portfolio that we think would be in that case, uh, but certainly not, it's not the loans that originated in that, um, that serviceability period that we're worried about. It's, it's the nature of the origination. Um, but I think the, you know, the, the big picture though will all come back to unemployment. So if people have jobs, or, People can get jobs, they've got income, and therefore they can uh, pay their debts. If they don't have jobs, then they can't. Um, and, and so that's the, the macro driver. You're right that some people might be a little bit more extended for their income or their situation's changed. Uh, but you know, I think we can, we can handle that piece. OK, did I got someone here at table two, if we can just get a mic. But in the meantime, we've got one at table five. Sure, thanks. Thanks for the comments, Anna and Peter. Really insightful. And I think it's longer than 19 years, isn't it? It is actually, but yeah. it's all right. Yeah. 
Um, just, just a question on the ability of customers to switch accounts, plays into the data, right? We've seen, obviously, telecommunications change a lot. Yep. You can switch. Um, we all like to have a bit of a choice, and often we're constrained by fees and complicated comparisons. So what do you think the ABA can... Um, what approach can you take to that in the future, especially with the, the digital tools we have now? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of switching that just happens. If you, if you look at the number of... Um, if you added up all the... Um, customers that banks say there are multiple of the econo uh, of the population and that's because people have bank accounts everywhere so I think technologies actually open that up um, payments move where they need to move so I don't think switching uh, is is s switching itself is is pretty easy these days uh, it just depends on w whether the people are thinking about switching or not um, so I'd, 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 I'm not sure there's a I don't feel like there's a problem in, in moving your banking now. If you look at mortgages, they move all the time. You look at you know, business lines, probably a little bit harder, and deposits move um, uh, pretty freely, as do transaction accounts. Mm. I, I might just give some data that we've just recently collected that I think really illustrates that. So we've only got data to December, but in the six months, um, the, the last six months of last year, 220,000 um, Australians switched their mortgage. And of that 220, 150,000, when I say switch, sorry, refinanced, of the 220,000, 150,000 went to a different lender. So the others um, refinanced within their own bank. Um, that, so the first time, and, and it's refinance at the, in that six months um, accounted for a higher percentage of loans than new loans. There's only once before that that's happened in the history of the data, and that was in 2020 when people took advantage of fixed rate um, to fix a, a very low rate. So it's, it's come back to um, in the, as a second half of last year, and these would be people who, for example, their fixed rate finished in September or October last year, so they've taken the opportunity to shop around, to look for a better deal in their own bank, and if they're not getting it, going to another. So. Um, it, it's, I've, just, I've done the figure and I've, it's just slipped out of my head, but it's about 1,500 Australians every working day are actually switching their mortgage or refinancing their mortgage. So, um, you know, there's a lot of activity out there and I'm sure every bank will tell you it's pretty competitive right now. Um, over here. Um, hi there, Peter. James Ayres from the Fin Review. Just a follow-up question to the two uh, previous ones, really. Um, on the mortgage markets, we had um, one of your rival CEOs on Wednesday, Matt Common, just talking about a lot of the mortgages being written at the moment were below the cost of capital. Uh, I just sort of wondered if you, and you said, you know, competition is very extreme in that market. I just wondered, you know, does that ring true to you? Is, is pricing that, that aggressive? And, and how would you describe um, competitive dynamics in mortgages? And then sort of follow up question uh, uh, on that switching theme you're just talking about. Do you see that competitive intensity in the mortgage market flowing through to deposit markets uh, anytime soon? Yeah, uh, so in, in terms of the mortgage market, I, don't, I, I can't think of a period where it's been more competitive than is, is at the moment. So it is, you know, it's a good deal for uh, customers uh, at the moment and there is plenty of uh, competition. So. Um, you know, I won't comment on, on what others have said, but from our perspective, it is uh, the most competitive I've ever seen uh, the mortgage market. Uh, deposits is the same. So uh, if I think about where our deposit rates are at the moment, you, um, you're around 4% for a savings account uh, where you grow your balance. Uh, TDs for 12 months around 4%. Um, for our, that's our, our lead offer at the moment. And so that's, a, again, that's well above uh, the the cash rate, and so uh, I think people are, are definitely competing for deposits as well. Um, so I, you know, we're in a market that is uh, very competitive. You've got to you got to balance your your, your loans and deposits, um, uh, and so it's it's probably a good deal for customers at the moment. Um, we've got a question down at table two. Uh, hi, Peter Ian Polari, Accenture. Just interested in your view on the health of corporate balance sheets and looking ahead, preparedness to invest? Yeah, I think um, it's, it's always hard to generalise, but I'd say there's, uh, there's probably a couple of camps. There's, there's those that um, have plenty of limits and plenty of cash, and they're really, I think, waiting for opportunities. So they're, uh, they're sitting back. There's those in industries that are a bit hard, and they're really managing 
their businesses hard. So they're more about um, you know, reducing costs, managing their margins and whatnot. Uh, and there's not a lot in the troublesome bucket at the moment, actually, in, in the corporate space. In fact, you know, in our, certainly in our portfolio, there's not a lot at all. So, so I think we've, you've, you've really, it's not, um, yeah, it, it depends on the company and the industry and, and what they're facing. But there's some that are sitting there waiting for opportunities, and I think then there's some that are, that are really starting to, to manage for the future and, and a tougher environment. Clancy. Hi, Peter. Clancy Yates from the Sydney Morning Herald. Um, <clears throat> you didn't sound too concerned about the small uptick in 30-day delinquencies, but you did say, you know, there's going to be more stress in the, book, the mortgage book this year. When do you expect that to happen? And, and how's the bank going to help? You said a few times you'll provide support for customers. Are you talking yep. about a, another mass deferral scheme like we saw in COVID, or what's the nature of that help? Yeah, so I, I think the trend is it's going to get harder. I think people are predicting the speed too fast um, because often uh, you have levers to offset challenges. So, so I'm, I'm thinking uh, the second half of this year probably now. Uh, in the, and it's not going to be, it's, it's not going to all happen at once. It's actually going to, uh, people will, um, you know, do their best to offset it, manage their businesses, but then uh, put their hand up for help. So it's not, it's not, you know, dare we say it, a cliff event. It's actually one that's just going to, uh, to go on. And it'll also depend on how long the interest rates stay high. So that's the other, we're talking about the peak. Now we're, we're closer to the peak than we've, we've been. Uh, and then the next question needs to be how long do they stay there uh, before they um, most likely come back down. So, so I think it's a, a 23, um, you know, second half of 23 when, when we'll f get to see it. So for us, probably you know, that our, our half year is March, so probably around June uh, into, the, into the period. In terms of helping, there's lots of options. So uh, it might be as simple as uh, restructuring a payment. It could be that we'll put people on interest only for a period of time. Uh, it could be restructuring the way their debt if they've got some expensive debt. So there's just, it depends on the issues. It won't be, uh, I can't say it being mass deferrals because that was just one technique for, for in our case, uh, a large chunk of the mortgage and small business portfolio. It'll be individual uh, this time, not a, not a mass deferral. And we have another one at that table? No? Yeah, hi, Peter. Joyce Malakas from The Australian. I just wanted to gauge your thoughts. The RBA governor this morning was asked about the ACCC looking at the deposit markets and the banks being very slow, in inverted commas, to pass on increases in deposits. I do understand that there are compelling rates out in the market, but how is Westpac expecting to navigate that uh, probe by the ACCC? And then I had another question Second question, just about borrowers drawing down on deposits. We heard Matt Common talking about that this week, and also the RBA governor this morning talking about about eight percent of the of borrowers not being in any position to save at the moment because their repayments have increased by so much. I'm just one, wondering anecdotally what Westpac is seeing on that front too. Yeah, well, just in you know, in, a, in a high level sense, in when we price for products, you're always thinking about supply and demand. So uh, for us, uh, in the last little while, uh, we've been well funded. Um, and that does influence how you think about your pricing uh, in deposits and, and wholesale markets. So uh, it's a supply demand uh, equation. And as it's got more competitive, uh, the price of, of deposits have gone up. Of course, we don't fund uh, ourselves at the RBA rate, that's the reference rate for the economy for um, setting interest rates. Uh, we have to go into the market to, to get funding and it's a competitive market. So that's, um, that's what we're doing when we're managing the liability side of the balance sheet is, is looking at our funding needs, looking at the price we need to pay in the market to, to attract deposits and, and there's lots of variables that go in, into those decisions. Um, sorry, Joyce, what was the, the second part of that uh, question? Just on borrowers dr uh, drawing down on savings to navigate. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, we're, we've seen a small change in those ahead. It was just over 70%, just under 70% now. So, um, you know, small change. So that says people um, are, are more on time than, than not. But I, I wouldn't see, uh, at this point, I haven't seen that as a, a major change. I think now that we're getting, if we get up, uh, 
two or three more rate rises, we're really above those 3% buffers that we thought about and the impact of those on some customers uh, will be bigger than the last couple of rate rises. Thank you. We have another on table 14, I think. Uh, yes, hi, Stephen Catchpole from Energetics. Uh, you mentioned earlier the climate challenge that we're facing as a country and as a global economy. Uh, what do you see as the bank's role, uh, Westpac's role in particular, in uh, addressing that? And what do you see as the blockers uh, stopping you from being able to do more? Well, you know, the bank's role is to uh, help people transition, that, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a word. And, and our role in the economy is to support businesses uh, to do what they need to do. In that case, it's to create the infrastructure we need to go uh, green in the electricity system is a big part. We will also have a role to help uh, consumers make their houses more efficient in um, in their electricity usage. So uh, we might we might need to lend to consumers to enable that transition. Likewise, with businesses, you think about transport, you think about um, other uses of fossil fuels, how do they move away from those uh, sources? So, so a big part on funding, uh, a big part on helping people understand uh, options and advice, um, uh, and you know, that will enable us. But we need a policy. You need, the country needs to know where are we gonna build these things you know, do we, uh, how quickly can we build the transition mechanisms, um, the storage mechanisms and whatnot? How are we going? Peter, I think you've exhausted them. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, can I... I exhausted you? No. <laughs> um, well, it is Friday afternoon. Um, no, we, I, I know Trans-Tasman prides themselves on um, making sure that uh, when they say an event finishes at 2 p.m., we finish at 2 p.m. and we've got a bit more time for you to um, have a bit more networking at your tables. Um, so can I just um, you know, join Peter in uh, thanking all of you for coming. Thank you for taking an interest in what's happening in banking. As I said uh, earlier, I think it's going to be a very interesting year for banks. Um, every year since I've got here, I keep saying, I start the year by saying, I think we've got an opportunity this year to put our head above the parapet and think in a different way. Um, than having to react to uh, a whole lot of other um, external things. It hasn't happened yet. I don't think it's going to happen in 2023. Uh, but uh, I do thank you all for your interest. Uh, there are many people in this room who work uh, with Australian banks, helping to make them, uh, making their businesses more efficient, making them better for customers, making them safer for the system as a whole. So thank you for that work. Um, I think there's plenty more of it uh, coming down the pipeline. So uh, thank you. And can I ask you to thank Peter for his um, insights? Right. We're going to stick here while they do a vote of things. What have we got to do? All right, uh, so uh, by way of introduction, my name's Luke Thomas. I'm the Vice President for uh, Appian Software in Asia, Pacific and Japan. And uh, uh, firstly, I wanted to pass on our thanks to, uh, to John, um, to Anna, and also to Jim, who uh, joined us uh, remotely. Um, and I have the pleasure today to uh, deliver the, the vote of thank thanks. Um, before I do, just, you know, to say a few words, um, you know, it's, it's insightful to, you know, to hear the, the challenges in the marketplace. And um, you used the word there, John, at the very beginning about we're going through a period of transition. It always feels like we're going through a period of transition. And, uh, you know, certainly from a, an Appian perspective, we work with a lot of large banks, including Westpac for that matter, and government organisations, um, defence and security organisations. And uh, it's probably the one common theme that we hear out there is transition. And certainly for the, uh, the other uh, members on the, uh, the table, it's a, a common uh, topic of conversation. Um, look, I might move on to the, uh, the token of appreciation. And, um, you know, what I would do, we wanted to do today was... Um, uh, sorry, let me just check my notes here, um, is uh, reflect, I guess, firstly on the, uh, the circle. And the circle re uh, uh, represents the indigenous cultures of the three countries that uh, participate as part of this, uh, this organisation, uh, Australia, New Zealand uh, and Singapore. And, um, uh, and uh, what we're going to be showing today or sharing today is um, the image... Um, is a creative interpretation of the traditional attachment 
to land and water um, that is so important to those uh, parts of the world. Um, so this, uh, this print has been provided by the creative director of the circle, uh, Thea Weiss, um, who is an Australian um, print maker and artist. And uh, on behalf of the circle, um, we'd like to thank you for your participation today. Thank you. So this um, uh, concludes the, the proceedings and, and on behalf of uh, the participants, um, Appian, the Australian Banking Association, IBM, uh, Snowflake and Workday as well as The Circle, um, we thank you for joining us today and uh, we look forward to uh, joining us again once again in the next event. So thank you very much everybody. Cheers.